following podcast is brought to you exclusively by the Arad Rob Radio Network. This is PBA champion Kyle Troop. Hey y'all, Jacob Ledger here. Jeff Riggles here from 11thFrame.com. Hey guys, Chuck Ritchie here, formerly of Bull TV. Hey guys, this is Ryan Schaefer of Track Staff at Valley Bowling Center in Waverly, New York. And you're listening to Straight Up 5 with Johnny Petraglia Jr. Yo, the boys from Straight Up 5, Rad Rob, Dr. Ocho, and of course, JP Jr. Pick it out. Fear the fro, baby. Welcome to Straight Up 5 with Johnny Petraglia Jr. A hard-hitting, in-depth, cutting-edge look into the world of bowling. This podcast will not only cover all things bowling, but will also give you a raw look into real-life issues. You'll get unfettered access into the mind of one of the most gifted bowlers of this or any other generation. Strike, and they claim it. Somebody does it! So without further ado... Let's introduce you to the hosts of the show. Rad Rob, Rob Francois. Rad Rob, Rob Francois. Dr. Ocho. Dr. Ocho. And the incomparable Johnny Petraglia Jr. Johnny Petraglia Jr. Hey guys, welcome back to Straight Up 5 with Johnny Petraglia Jr. This is episode 109. We have a very special guest tonight. As always, I am your host, Rad Rob, Rob Francois. Uh, my machine tells me I'm right. See, I can't even get that right. Love that from I do indeed love chicken from Popeyes, though. This is episode 109. As I said, we have Steve Geralds as our guest here. Uh, but before we bring him in, I need to introduce my first co host. He is the man with the golden mask. He has the Largest arms on this podcast. He is the resident doctor of Straight Up Five. Don't let him, don't let him fool you. He actually is a smart guy. It is the one and only Doctor Ocho. What's going on, Ocho? You even got your Popeyes chicken button wrong because, like, I would think that would be something you could do in your sleep. That's pretty sad, isn't it? Given yeah. like you know the uh, the copyright infringement and uh, you know just 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 to be able to like nail that. I, it's it's got to be it's your alarm clock for one I know right don't you have that set as your ringtone your alarm clock everything my ring my my text alert yes it's all correct so and then you hit the uh, well you were you're allowed to be right once in a while so at least you gave yourself <laughs> that who else is here Rob Nico's in the house Crambone's in the house we got Amanda Moore in the house Brett Loringer was here early before we were we did not ditch the Facebook feed we're still here uh, thank you for joining us on YouTube. Thank let's, you. let's introduce the star of the show. He is my other co-host. He is the sexiest man in the world. He is the son of a living legend. A legend in his own right, honestly. Uh, and he's loved by many. Hated by few. I, that's all. I got nothing new. Johnny P, what's going on, brother? You almost hit that perfectly on the head, dude. I think it's more like hated by a ton and loved by a few. But- <laughs> I, I appreciate it very much. Good to have you here. Good to see you. You're looking uh, amazing, as always, as you always do. I made it home safe from uh, Las Vegas. That's a success in my book. That is a success in your book. Yes, absolutely. Uh, nice chicken you got there behind you. I assume uh, that's Lucas. This, this was the best part of my trip to Vegas. Yeah, I named him Lucas on a random night with uh, all 25 <laughs> members of the Strike It Rich Pro Shop team. Uh, but uh, yeah, somehow, some way, I landed on Lucas. I was looking for something more creative, like, like Chester Kane or something, something at least chicken related. But it was the best part of my trip because it was gifted. I actually kind of commandeered it, but then it was gifted to me by, uh, well, I guess the only kid I'll ever have, and that's Derica. So wanted to thank her for the uh, screaming chicken. <laughs> and it goes up to forty five seconds, which. When I, needless to say, when they had to open my suitcase to check on the way home, it made for a pretty exciting experience for uh, TSA. So uh, I make that like... noise so often in the late evening in the yeah. Ocho household, just was, to let you know, folks. I say that, that also sounds like me. Already. And, and yeah. JP has heard it many o time. Sounds like me right now with uh, the kidney infection that I have. So uh, 
Yeah, that's yeah. Uh, that's really annoying. I'm I'm sorry to hear that. I hope you stop uh, pissing needles. It sucks. To I mean, it's yeah, it's, it's like having kidney stones, but you're not going to pass anything, so it's never going to end until the antibiotics finally get it to work. But uh, if I had to step out a couple times in the show, everybody, uh, I'm trying to be professional, but you know, duty calls. But, Leave uh, the hot mic on, please. <laughs> yeah, I want to hear about it. Ah, about it. God, oh, God, God, oh, my God. God, son of a <laughs> Texas, fall off, would you? That's Columbus that hurt. Oh, that's horrible. Uh, in any event, we do have our special guest here. He is in the green room. Um, he uh, is bowling this weekend, so he's joining us from his hotel room. Um, look, guys, I mean, we had the best guests ever, right? Elise was on a cruise. We got Steve was, uh, from his hotel. Belmo was from his hotel. JP I mean, was from his hotel, for Christ's sakes. That's true. See, there you go. Yeah. Uh, but as always, we do have a highlight package I want to play for our special guests. So we'll be here back we go. in 30 minutes. And uh, here we go. Welcome to Straight Up Five. <laughs> Here's the highlight reel from the career of Steve Jarris. Win, Chris. Steve Jarris is going to win the tournament. Even if Nyer makes the split, the 3 6 7, he would finish with 201. As you see the ball sliding by, Nyer sends it too wide. 3 6 7, winner Steve Jarris in his first championship round. And the only consolation for Andy Nyer, also a non winner, is $20,000. So you see Mom Jarris and Wendy, Steve's wife, fifth. $38,000 a week's all paid vacation for in Plaza. We'll be back Oklahoma after this. Credit Kevin McGeer with a very cerebral shot. Back to back weeks with pressure. 300 to 279 last week. Mike Albee over David Ozio. Now difference of 43,000 winning or losing. He has left the 2-4-8-10. Now, what faces Kevin McGear is he must make the 2-4-8. and eight. Forget the 10-pin. Go for the tie. That's exactly what it is. Steve Jaros looks to the scoreboard. He says McGear must get three pins to tie. What happens now? It's a 224 tie. We're going to bowl the ninth and tenth frames. Steve Jaros will get up and bowl one frame. Steve Jaros to take all the cash to 38,000 and go against Gene Stuss in the challenge needs a spare and seven. Anything less, McGear wins the championship. Seed surviving this morning's roll off. A nice trip to wherever you said it was, Bahamas or Hawaii. They have choice hotels everywhere and a chance for 25,000 more in the challenge match. There it is, a lock. Oh, yes. Nine and a winner. Steve Jones, 49. Kevin McGear, 36. The summer classic champion is Steve Jarris of Illinois. Hey, <laughs> I'm keeping you. That's a crucial mistake right there. Parker. The ball. Nine pins to win. Trying to become number 75, with just a mark to win in his first ever TV appearance. Any kind of mark, he's your champion. A title on the line for Chris Johnson. Unbelievable. Look out! What a split he's got to face wow. here. What a break for Steve Jarris, and just like that, 
He is a champion in Toledo. And the kids missed it. Best way to the sheet, T35. Stranger things have happened on the PDA Tour of the 10th grade. Six fighters. Oh. Yeah. And that's a winner. Steve Jarris gets congratulations from his wife, June. His fifth career PBA title comes today in Dallas. Impressive. Couldn't have come at a time. If you link Xone.com, baby. <coughs> Being displayed by Steve Jarris, he showed absolutely no emotion. This shot right here was the big shot that all but clinched the title for him, and he showed no emotion going dead flush. All he needs is a mark in the 10th frame, and it, this tournament is his. That's what he needs. Looking for the seven bagger. 10th frame, a little bit high. Man. Does it again. <laughs> wow. Can you believe it? <laughs> for every single show and every tournament, Next year and years beyond, right? That's can, three for three. Can you say homeschool? <laughs> All right. Can I say thank you, Dynasty? Unbelievable. Thank you. In the last few weeks, but he needs a mark. Any kind of a spare strike, he'd certainly like to do it in one ball a strike. And he will win this year's Tournament of Champions, $100,000 and a two-year exemption. This guy didn't think he was going to have a job about a month ago, and now he's your Tournament of Champions champion. Incredible moment for Steve Jarris. Wife June, the twins, are going to get a very early birthday present. They turn six May 25th. Just needs five. Yes! Yeah! Evan Hannah, it's for you guys. I love you. Yes. Kids, there's your birthday present. Dad is a major champion for the first time in his career as Steve Jarris takes the 2005 PBA Dexter Tournament of Champions. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our very special guest, Steve Jarris. Steve, good evening, sir. Hey, guys. How you doing? Good. Good to have <laughs> you here. Thank you for, that was uh, quite the video. <laughs> quite a career. No, and no, honestly, that, uh, that TOC is uh, pretty much what's going to get you into the Hall of Fame this year. So uh, yes. it's, it's a very special thing that you accomplished there. Uh, that's back in my own stopping grounds from uh, Connecticut, too, the Mohegan Sun. I... Uh, I grew up uh, out of Bradley Bowl in Windsor Locks, so uh, I frequented Mohegan Sun quite often. It's a it was a really cool place to uh, to win your major. It was, and it was a great. It, I was fortunate enough in all the years that I bowled on tour to bowl in a lot of different settings, and the arenas were always my favorite. Uh, was the, the the electricity of the crowd. Erie was the first one that I had bowled in, and the fans were just fantastic. And we they followed that along to Connecticut and every arena that I bowled at. It's been amazing. Absolutely right. Yeah, Erie was uh, one of my favorites to watch. Uh, that was the um, split fire open that Danny Wiseman won. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, he beat me. <laughs> he beat you on that one. But uh, yeah, I mean, the stadium crowds were, were definitely uh, a cool thing. Johnny, what you got for our very special guest, brother? I guess first and foremost, uh, thanks for not only joining us, but like not only rushing into your hotel room, but like hopping immediately on before you even had time to unpack your toiletry bag. So, and, uh, uh, it's great to see you, and obviously we'll get to more of this discussion later, but sure. congratulations on your absolutely overwhelmingly well-deserved uh, Hall of Fame induction. Thank so you. All Thank is you. lucky. To, the Hall is lucky to have you, and I, I hope that the family as well. Um, I guess as far as uh, the first question, the first question I, I actually, you know what? I want you, Rob, to read the first question from the fans after this one that I have, because I'm definitely not stealing the show again. Sure, All sure. Right. Steve, 
I've I've always been an admirer admirer of you because you got to remember you were one of the like most recognizable faces of Brunswick tour staff when I was in like my I want to be a pro bowler years the mid nineties. Mm-hmm. Um, when you actually when you mentioned uh, Erie, I think I remember you leading that tournament, and I I want to say the bowl you were using was a Raven Quantum during qualifying, but it was something dark in the Danger Zone era. Yeah. And in that time period, the thing I love most about your game was how under it and loaded you were and how you would actually have to collapse your arm behind your ear before you would reopen it because you had so much pop at the bottom. Right. And then as the years progress, um, I noticed you significantly get more on the side of it mm-hmm. and that exactly what Ocho is doing. <laughs> exactly. Of the elbow. Yep. That's, mm-hmm. I mean – what was that all about? What uh, made that change happen? Like, what was what was the whole process behind that? Well, the the whole uh, the whole follow through was something that I had my entire life. I learned to bowl that way. That was the whole thing. Just follow through all the way through your target, and that that's where I got a lot of the. You're right. A lot of the power and and the hit came from that. Um, what changed over the years as lane conditions had, had changed, and as I was changing and getting a little bit older, it was harder to keep up with some of the rev rate that I needed to do. Um, actually, it might have been at Carolier when we were practicing in between match play rounds when when all the guys that didn't make the cut would get out there and bowl in between. Um, John Jowdy was out there working with some of the players, and he just kind of came up to me and he asked me, you know, what I was, you know, what I was wanted if I wanted to work on anything, if there's anything that I had any questions. And he never really liked my follow through. He never really liked the way I hit it. He thought I was hitting up on the ball, and he liked to have the ball get down into the lane a little bit smoother and a little bit longer. And um, it took me a while to kind of grasp what he was talking about until I started shooting some spares. And he's like, that's the follow through that I want because my spare shot, it was just long. I didn't do anything to it. And he tried to incorporate that more into my game where I could load up on it and actually do a little bit less to it. And the ball would save up energy better. And that I had done that change right before I had that really big year on tour where I had won the three times in one year. That was at the end of the, the video there. And it, it was really weird because I started throwing it a lot straighter and it literally made all the patterns almost look the same to me for the rest of that season, which was amazing. So that, that's kind of where that came into. And now I'm kind of still on the side of it a little bit more. I think that's just age. <laughs> sure. I wouldn't mind getting back to where it was because that seems to be where the game's at. Even on a senior tour, the PBA 50 stuff, it, it, you, you still have to shape it a little bit more. And I've been working on trying to get that back a little bit more. I just, I, I wanted to always know that because <clears throat> you were dominant in, in, in like both ways of, of, of those styles. So, mm-hmm. and that's, that's pretty rare and, and to me pretty awesome. So no, really one of the, one of the one guys that a significant change in their release, but yet still managed to tackle the tour the way, you know, titles on the way he threw it under it, the way he threw right. it out of it. And you don't see that. You know, you know what I think is the most comparable, I guess, in like a recent day and age is kind of like what Mike Fagan did. Mike Fagan used to be called the king of swing. If you look at the last four or five years of his of his career out there, he was as straight as as Barnes was half the time with that. He went from getting really through it at the bottom and kind of just staying, keeping lines more in front of him. So mm-hmm. I'd say that's more of, of like that modern day transition when they, they were, the guy was able to perfect both sides of the coin or, or both different ways of doing it. Yeah, it it I I mean it really made it more effortless to me, and it, it made the it made it for me much easier to read the patterns because it took the fronts out of play. I did I mean looking back at some of the videos, I did have a little bit of an uphit to it, but I, I mean I, I grew up in the urethane era and the, the the first urethane era, and it was a different way you had to throw it and you had to shape it different. And you know it's oddly enough, I like going straight up five now. <laughs> <laughs> was, was it difficult though i mean was it like because i mean like usually when somebody you know changes their mechanics uh, I, and honestly i don't know enough about how mechanically you change because everything was the same until your arm came to here basically until your mm-hmm. arm was almost at 45 degrees after the release but uh was it a difficult thing for you to do or you were just able to seamlessly kind of just instead of just popping at it like a like a, almost like a softball pitch right. you'd, you'd come around it and let the ball do a lot of the work i guess 
Well, I mean, all the years that I bowled on tour, there's so much mus muscle memory that you develop that you really had to retrain yourself to feel that this is the new normal. So it can't now. be that easy. That's what I mean. It was You it, made it look. No. That's what. That's what I was getting at. I was trying to pay you a half ass compliment there, but <laughs> I appreciate but it. Because it. it can't be that easy to change some habits. No, and and it wasn't because I mean I had to really think to, to in in my mind when I was going to the line, I felt like I was almost cutting the ball short where I wasn't following through at all. Um, almost more like a Stu Williams type of a thing. You're afraid like the ball's just gonna to like it. sit there and just do exactly. nothing. Exactly. So I, I really had to resist the urge to grab it and hit up on it. And it, it took it took a few weeks. And and luckily Jowdy was out there almost every week. He was roughing for Columbia at the time. Eventually just became just a a staple out there of, of people that he would coach. And it was I was honored that that I caught his eye and that he wanted to work with me and we had great success. And he you just said a, a few weeks. Place. That's something that could take somebody two years to try and perfect. And like, <laughs> eh, it took a couple of weeks. And then, of course, I had my, you know, it's not like riding a bike, Steve. Let's be that's, honest here. That's, that's true. But when you look at the course of a season, we probably bowl the equivalent of two league season. In that's true. Year you're you're then, not so wrong. You're not we did wrong. have a lot of games. So no, it, it, it wasn't without work. <laughs> you know, you, you, you pack 150 games in a, in a week. And I guess you do get <laughs> yeah. the reps in. I get it. I get yeah. it. It's definitely not the same now as it was back in the day. I mean, there was so much more uh, that they had to go through to just to, to you know to make even match play or, or make the cut. Yeah. I mean, they, they bowled so many games. And I think uh, it's coming back around again. They're starting to see longer formats again. It, it's getting to be more of a tour where you're seeing guys bowl different cities, which I always enjoyed. I just wish they would make it longer. I mean, or you know, have summer tours or or winter mm -hmm. tours again. They just I don't know why they they don't. I guess uh, just TV contracts probably. But I mean. Back in the day on ABC, I mean, you had, you know, you had a long tour. I mean, whether it was the winter tour, the summer tour, and then when ESPN took over, you guys are still bowling in the summer. So, I mean, yeah, you were we bowling. very much time off. Exactly. And you had more chances to win titles. Um, sure. We had Belmo on the show, uh, and he talked about um, the old guys. We, we, we kind of asked him what, it, what, what would have happened. Why did they uh, – why did – you know, bowling lose ABC or, or why did ratings go down or, or why couldn't they get sponsors? And he, he kind of put it on the old guard said that you guys didn't really take care of, or even realize that it was going to go away. But I mean, you, he kind of said you guys didn't take care of uh, what you had. Is, is there any credence uh, behind that? Well, I mean, it, I guess there could be, I mean, obviously it's a different time now. We didn't have the social media presence that we had then. We, we weren't able to create the fan, the fan base that we might, that, that some of these guys are able to get now. Right. Um, a lot of what had happened with changing the uh, ownership a couple of times and the ABC thing was, it was a sponsorship deal that I, I can't remember everything that happened for the reason why we, we were no longer on them, but I know they were paying us rights money to be on the show, right? to be on the network, which a lot of that money was being used to help finance the summer tour and some of the fall tour. I mean, a lot of it was being used to help the tour go throughout the years. And as you know, the, the economic stuff started changing and sponsorships started, started dropping out is, is when it kind of started happening. And, and could they have done something different? Maybe, but that's people smarter than me. You know, it's an interesting topic, and every single time that we bring it up, I don't want to stick on this too long because I know we have a fan question, Rob, but, like, Steve, you know, when, when Jason was on, he said the one thing that really, really got me was he said, look at the two-hour shows now compared to the 90-minute shows of, of the ABC telecast. And he says, and look at how many commercials there are nowadays compared to how many are on the older shows. Mm -hmm. So after going back and studying, I realized there's a hell of a lot less in the 90-minute segment. But every single commercial on there, it's like there's Pet Boys, there's AC Delco, there's Quaker State, there's all the Budweiser. They were all from the, the, the big sponsors of the tour yeah. at that time. And now, if you get lucky, we, we get a couple Bolero commercials. We get a couple, you know, Go Bowling commercials. Right. And then they the, they kind of just replay a few more. So I guess my quick my crazy question is, is I feel like we had the sponsors and nowadays they don't have the sponsors right so I'm not, like i don't really understand where he was going with that because it's are they jamming that much more is it that much more important to have the kind of see what i'm shooting at here Rob? yeah yeah I'm, I'm thinking if we had two hour shows back then we probably could have got more commercial airtime for a lot of those guys too because you're right there were a lot of different sponsors that, that we had you know tom's was a sponsor and and 
True Value and you know, AC Delco. I mean, they, all the tournaments, they had sponsored specific tournaments and they all had airtime on the shows sure. every week. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, what was more memorable, winning the TOC or <laughs> throwing a 300 on TV? They were both very memorable. <laughs> <laughs> um, the 300 was, was memorable for a few reasons because it almost didn't get aired. Um, that was, um, it, it really got, it probably shouldn't have gotten aired just ba based off of some of the technical stuff that happened on the truck, but it was by sheer luck that we actually had a copy of it. Uh, back then the shows were taped delayed by a day. So we filmed that on, on Saturday for the show to be sh uh, shown on Sunday. And um, we were in Chattanooga. The, the owner of the center, the manager had asked if they could put a VHS copy into the, uh, into the, uh, into the recorder so they can get a copy for the center, just like the raw footage. And if they hadn't have done that, we probably wouldn't have had the show because what had happened is there's something that happened with the cables where they had got reversed and the master copy had all the, um, had all like, like the, the master copy had all the commercials burned into it. So they weren't able to use that or it had the time code burned into the master copy so that when they go to edit the show, they weren't able to, uh, to use that because you had this big time code that was across the bottom. Um, VHS copy didn't have that, although the quality wasn't quite as good. Um, they did some, some editing and they cleaned it up a little bit and a couple weeks later they showed it at 1 30 in the morning without any advance notice but it but it's been kind of uh it, it's been kind of a, a historic event now because if you did happen to catch it it was great if not it was on espn classic for a long time and it'll, it'll live forever on youtube since <laughs> since i didn't know it was tape delayed when did you find like obviously you want like oh my god all my friends are gonna see what i just did <laughs> when did we tell you that hey just so you know like they when did. did you actually find out <laughs> so <laughs> so we had, uh, so we had all right here we go we had just bought uh we just bought a motor home to travel um my wife was pregnant at the time we were expecting twins and we had a, a fifth wheel that we're traveling in. We just upgraded to a motorhome so we can make it easier to travel. So those two weeks, she happened to be out with me. And she had witnessed the uh, the 300 game. And uh, we drove home from Chattanooga right after the show. Drove through the night, stopped a couple of times, and literally pulled into my driveway five minutes before the show came on. We all we all run in. We had our family and friends over. We turned the show on, and they're showing car wrecks. And I, I actually called. We were in Erie the next week, so I called the uh, the, the press uh, the press room they're like oh yeah by the way uh we had a problem with the show <laughs> that's how i found out thinking about it i'm like getting a, mad just thinking about it <laughs> like of all the things like what are the odds like that particular part got messed up like that's like when, we, when i was in high school and i won a wrestling match like i'd be mad if it wasn't in the paper like i can't imagine what this would be like like this is an actual professional sport that was supposed to be televised. Oh my gosh! I know, and the fact—I mean, I shoot three hundred. I win the and title, yeah. and and there was there was speculation as to whether they were going to pay the bonus for the three hundred game because it wasn't technically televised. And the PBA actually put that to rest, and they they had the check out actually by the end of the week, which was probably the fastest they've ever paid the, the bonus. For you know, that. I bet if social media was around, they probably would have scrutinized that more than anything. They'd have been like, ah, no way. He probably just put the the X's in, and they just wanted to get a, a, Think about a big story. Mad, yeah, you know, they get now when uh, we have to wait an extra twenty minutes because they're picking high 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 players or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is that really how it's pronounced? High 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 yeah. Um, You're right. <laughs> are you the only one to throw 300 and win? Um, Johnny is shaking his head now. I don't know. Probably not. I mean, I mean, it wasn't for the title, but I mean, no, no, I mean all the shot the, 300. I mean, win the, win the whole tournament because no, but, usually. Bob uh, when, didn't Bob, Bob, Bob Benoit and Bob, Bob Benoit right? got 300 for the he title. Um, okay. Mike Albee beat David Ozio uh, 300 to 79 yeah, for the title. Wichita, 93. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's a good question, though. It's very rare because we've seen a lot of people throw 300 and then just just dump it the next game. I mean, you're, a bit of a letdown. You're, you're, yeah, I mean, your your adrenaline goes up here. The just still kind of like work their way in there. That's what it is. <laughs> That's, so, true. Right. That's true. Right before that show, I was changing the, the grips on my spare ball, and Art McKee was the ball rep out there, and uh, we're at the at the workout table, and I'm like, well, I hope I don't need this, and I didn't for one game. <laughs> Uh, you know, that power torque seemed to be a very uh, popular ball. It seemed like everybody was throwing it uh, at that time. We're, we're big fans, obviously, of, of the OG power torque, but uh, it, it worked pretty well for you. 
that was a great ball. That was the first time that I had won with a reactive ball because that was right when everything was changing. I mean, my, right. first, my first title was with the Blue Hammer, and the, the 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 reactive balls really hadn't been coming out yet. They were starting to. So that was uh, that was one of my first ones. The Beast was another one that I threw that week, which is a great reactive ball, and uh, great ball. it uh, they hooked a little bit at Edmond there. I had some I had some recovery, so it was kind of cool to see myself hook it again. Steve, real well, quick, well, do, well, do the reactive well. balls make you also kind of take your hand out of it? Is that one of the things? That, I don't I don't know. Maybe it you. They can. Um, that was one of that might have been one of the reasons why the change went this way yeah and and i actually was able to throw the reactive for quite a while before i had to kind of adjust it because uh, we were yes. going through particle, we were going through other other reactive but there were a lot of guys that had a hard time adjusting to that to that reaction because it was so much stronger so some of the power players that made their living being able to do something different than everybody else could were all of a sudden I had trouble controlling this and everybody else made the lanes look stupid for a while. So I was going to ask you that because, you know, a lot of people that came, you're kind of in between both eras, but I mean, you know, a lot of guys that came from the eighties throwing urethane did have trouble. I mean, you're talking the best in the world, uh, you know, had trouble throwing reactive resin, but uh, some guys like you were able to figure out uh, Johnny's dad was able to figure out he threw 300, you know, uh, during the reactive era. So um <clears throat> What did you kind of do? I mean, did obviously you you probably, did you throw a lot of practice games with it? I mean, like when you knew this yeah, technology, two weeks, was hooked. It's a, it's yeah, a couple weeks. Shot, uh, <laughs> when you knew this tech was coming out, I mean, were you a little worried? Um, not at first. I mean, it because it was still the early versions of those still weren't super strong. They were completely different. I mean, the, the, when the X caliber first came out, we saw the, the the ball on the show for the first time. Oh my gosh! I mean, the guys are recovering the ball from. The weeds. I mean, they were coming out of nowhere, <laughs> and, that and it was it was cool to watch. <clears throat> that was the first time we saw two four eight ten. <laughs> yeah, that was the ninety two <laughs> AC Delta, Steve. That they're watching Mark McDowell throw that. Oh my gosh! That show, Mark yeah. McDowell ninety two AC Delta. That's what that's what Steve's talking about right now. Yep. But like going like what he oh what he was saying just going from my childhood was I remember a solid eight years of the gyros follow through that I know. And that was all the way through. Like I'm going back like through the danger zones when we had yep. condition danger zones, like, <laughs> 10 pin with an orange pin or a purple pin. But like, we're talking like through the T2s, the Sage Quantums all the way up to like, I want to say like you were almost already with Dynathane at the time when you started, that or maybe even, maybe even track, like who was that ball that, that rev master or whatever that blue thing was that you made TV with. I feel oh like yeah, um, yeah. So what is that like? Oh one, oh two. It was. Um, it would have been like oh, oh yeah, exactly. Right about oh one, oh two. Um, Dynathane was uh, who I was with at the time. I was with Track the year before that. I, I seem to kind of follow Phil after after all that. I mean, I was with Brunswick for a long time. I mean, actually, your dad was the one who offered me my first ball contract, and we were we were out on the and, and it was really unsolicited because I I just been out there trying to do what I could and just try to make 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 a living out there and he approached me one day and and they had uh evidently i caught their eye and and they they yeah, offered talent kind of knows oh, talent yeah. too that's oh, yeah. thing. Hey, that's <laughs> my dad saw another guy with a mustache glasses and dark hair he's like <laughs> yeah, this guy's perfect <clears throat> you have no idea how many times i got mistaken for him after that <laughs> <laughs> I would literally throw a shot in a, in, a, in a practice session and somebody would turn around with the with, with the page turned to him. And I'm like, all right, so you just saw me bowl and I bowled with the right hand. I'm right handed. <laughs> <laughs> but I would sign my picture. I'd flip it over to mine. But I, I would get him. I would get Albie. Um, I, I'd get a few people. It had to be the glasses and the mustache. <laughs> Absolutely. I see the Albie thing. That, that he, could be, he could be like the mixer of you guys. He could be yeah. the mediator, basically. Half of my friends on tour that I hung around with were calling me Johnny all the time, so... That's That's hilarious. <laughs> when you were going into that tie with Kevin McGurr, um, what, what were you thinking? I mean, he let that split and you're like, and I saw you look at the scoreboard, like, <laughs> like, what does he need to tie? Right. Like what was going yeah. through your mind at that point? Brian Berg was standing, was sitting behind me for the whole show. We were kind of chatting in between shots and um, I, I, all I, I kind of lost the pair, I think, a little bit in the middle. I, I got lined up. I think I threw the last three or four to, to, to give him in a position where he had to go strike spare. And once he threw the first strike, I'm like, well, that's that's probably it. And as soon as he two, four, eight, ten, I looked over at the score sheet, and I'm, I'm like, he needs three of these to tie. And he's going to make it to win. He needs three to tie. And he almost took the two, eight straight back off the four. I mean, yeah. that, that would have been 
unusual. But Absolutely. yeah, I, it just gave me new life, and I, I just think the way the the way the roll off format was is I. I believe I, I started on you did. You I, started, I, I started on the lane that we just finished on, but now, yeah. I mean, he would have had the choice as to whether to start or, or, or not. And I think that helped me because I, I just got off that pair or off that lane rather. And I, I struck out and I was, I, I had the adrenaline going. So as soon as I put up the first strike and he didn't strike, I'm like, well, I can't get shut out. And it, it was, it was pretty, pretty amazing. It was unexpected, but it was, it was amazing. And you almost tied Gene after that in the challenge match. I did, and I you know in that match I, I completely forgot we had to bowl another match because we were we were still bowling. I, I was still coming down from the title match, right. and then yeah, we almost had the same scenario. He he kind of nudged out the flat ten at the end, and uh, and and it was almost the same way. I, I lost a pair in the middle, and I think I punched out in the tenth again to force him to do something, and it didn't work out the second time. But too bad it would have been extra. What twenty five grand? Twenty five. Yeah, I was yeah. happy enough winning the title. <laughs> exactly. Exactly right. <laughs> Johnny, have you have you two ever met personally oh, yeah. over the years? Okay, yeah. I, I figured you being a, I figured you being an alley rat over the years, hanging out. Oh my god, we! I I don't know how many roller coasters we rode at the Six Flags event when we were filming at, at Great Adventure. I mean, that was uh, yeah. <clears throat> it's that funny because you guys had uh, you guys had Haugen on a couple weeks ago, and uh, he was he was on the show. He was on our team, and he would ride out. He was riding the coasters with us, and I was sitting in the car with him for a few of them. And the whole way up, he's got his hands over his eyes. He's freaking out the whole way up. We get up to the top of the hill, and everything's off. He's just flying down the hill. He just didn't like the, the way up. But, uh, but we rode a lot of the, the rides, too. I mean, that was a great time. That's kind of the way I am with coasters. I'll get on any coaster. But the, the ride up, I'm like 100%. I'm sure most people go through this. Either the whole thing's going to stop, and now I have to walk down grabbing a hand. I wouldn't like that. <laughs> or I'm the only seat that as soon as we're about to go over, the seat of The lap bar is going to go. <laughs> yeah. Those are obviously the two things that we out the wall, unless you're just, you know, whatever. But anyway, but Haugen, that was that at Six Flags Great Adventure right here in New Jersey. You guys, you we were on the global team wearing yep. six pack ab shirt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the wife beaters the next day. <laughs> and, <laughs> yes, yes. And, uh, and uh, King Daka was the brand new one yes. that shoots you out at like 80 miles an hour and takes you straight up 400 feet. No, no, and Haugen spent uh, like an hour arguing with Robert Smith. Who Robert yeah, still in the chat? You have to remind me. Haugen basically that's he, the only one he absolutely refused to get on because he knew he would have to wait at the top of the track for a little while before the actual drop oh, and yeah. scared the shit out of him. Meanwhile, he lucked out because there's like a two and a half hour wait, and we and oh. the guys had to get back to the lanes. Half the time we were there, you couldn't even see the top of the track because the clouds were so low. <laughs> oh, wow. so I, I wanted nothing to do with that one. I wrote all the rest of them, though. I, I might have ruined okay, if you're for Christina, We all still think you are a <laughs> screaming chicken. We love you, though. That's a funny story. Um, <clears throat> did anybody? Johnny, I think I was there that day, by the way. Didn't I bring my nephew over there to watch that show? I, I, there were so many there. recordings. Um, it ran mm -hmm. over several days. Yeah, we well we we uh, it was one of the days we were going into Parker's truck because somebody had uh, jacked their neck up and everything, and I'm trying to do my thing and on the rides we, probably. Yeah, it's <laughs> most likely. That was 100 uh, when I'm not sure if you and I were there on the same the same. No, you, we, no, we totally were. It was just uh, it was uh, it was, I, I, I it was got to be like it was when Belmo first came out. Maybe like the following year was he like making like his 08, appearance 09? there? I want to well, we say there two years, I think. I, think I want to say flight. like oh oh eight ish oh nine ish something like that. Well, the Is first that year right? we bowled it, it was they they grouped us by age because I, I I was they, they they just literally went by by age group. The second year they turned it into the manufacturers cup, and that's when when Robert and Haugen and we were all the, the nine hundred global team got the bowl. So that I, I liked it better right. when they did it that way. I remember CDB was there too. Did I get yep. it right? CDB. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yep. 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 Speaking and your, of Parker, and, and dad flushed one and he left a stone freaking nine. Oh my god, I remember. And he was mic'd up. He's like, I gotta flush this one, Randy. And he buried it with a stone nine. That's <laughs> you know what's crazy as we keep talking about all this, Steve. Does this ever happen to you, or am I just crazy and I need to be remind, reminded of it? Like when people go back and say, Oh, I remember that was this year. That was like, oh, I saw you know the Scorpions uh, live love at first thing, 1984. Just 
I remember what year it is based off the bowling balls. I remember you guys. I had to use my nephew's age for this yeah. one, but I'm yeah. watching you. I do Steelers score, so that's my thing. It's, I get it. I totally like, get it. Is that just strange? Like that's the only way I remember. Like I, I remember, I, I remember what year he threw the Sage Tour. I remember what year he shot ten pins with, or I remember him leading the TSC in '96 because he was throwing a T2. Like that's the way my brain operates. Right. It's crazy weird science. Thank goodness they change balls so quickly, so you have one for every year, and that's how you freaking line it up. See, now they're doing too many. I'm losing it. Right. <laughs> I know. You... I was. I was telling my wife. It's like I. I can remember. I can't remember where I put my keys half the time, but I could tell you what I shot, you Me know, too. at Landmark in the fourth frame against Webb, you know, on the Absolutely. show. <laughs> That's hilarious. That was a two pin, by the way. <laughs> Did you uh, expect, I mean, no, actually, that's a stupid question. Nobody expected Parker to miss that spare to give you the opportunity to win. Um, what, what was going through your head when that, when that happened? Well, that, I mean, Parker pulled an amazing game because that left yeah. lane was ugly. Um, that, I don't remember exactly what happened in practice because I know Ricky Ward was on the show, Jason Couch was on the show, and the, the left lane was just god awful. And um, I, I the, the the spare that he missed was just I think on the it, kind of a fill shot, so I think it made a difference of me needing a strike and a and a nine to win, which yeah. which was huge. That's definitely uncharacteristic of him, but the fact that one of the shots that he threw, I mean, he could have he should have doubled. To, to win the tournament probably in that spot and people don't realize how good he had to throw it on that lane and he chose to finish on that lane he was the uh the tournament leader i don't miss the gold pins that's for sure uh looking no, back i got a it. set of them from the show for after do you really nice. yeah just looking at it to me i don't know they're just gaudy johnny what do you think of those pins <clears throat> at the time i enjoyed them because at the king of the hill that matt Menente ran every month at carolier if you made it to the uh title match he would throw in the gold pins Nice. So it felt cool to bowl on them. Visibly, no. I like looking at black bowling balls and, and white pins, you know, mm -hmm. traditional like that. But uh, I didn't dislike them. I thought, I, you know, I did, but obviously, you know, not my, I'll give them like a, a five and a half out of 10. And I honestly think that I, they should have been a couple ounces heavier. I think they were at about like 310 from 36. I think so, yeah. I, I think that we saw, I guess, a slight difference, but not enough to really distinguish like hey the greatest guys in the world are knocking down an extra seven pounds a rack rather than however many ounces of, you know 40 ounces is for whatever is in there i i think they could have been a little bit heavier yeah and they, they, they did move a little bit different i mean i thought they stayed a little bit lower but yeah you're right they, they still were pretty lively i thought yeah the the thing that i've always been curious about if anything over the years as far as pins is how like when you guys are bowling on pro lane the ring, the ring 10 is an extreme possibility, but it seems like every time you guys are on an HPL or an SPL service, there is no such thing as a ring 10. It's always either a flat 10, like the, it's amazing the characteristics of different houses, what kind of strikes and leaves they produce compared to one another. Right. I'm sure uh, obviously, being, uh, you know, the HPLs have a little more friction to them. So I think the balls tend to burn up a little bit more. And I think that's, that's why I see that. And it seems like the gutter always will bounce a little bit more on the HPLs than they did on the, on the, uh, the, the, an, the pro anvil. Absolutely. And I think because the, the pro anvils tended to, I think at the time be a little bit harder, they were a little bit cleaner through the front and that would definitely create the angle for the, for the ring tens. And you know, what it is the other thing, Steve, and I'm only bringing this up because it's an interesting topic. I think when I, at least when I worked capital for Brunswick, it was, the SPL surface was 5 16 uh, sandwich style, and the pro lane was 7 16 solid phenolic. So between the sponginess of the sandwich style compared to the solid and the mm -hmm. and the two extra or and the extra eighth of an inch, that kind of answers partially the initial question, right? Yeah, I, th I think so. I mean, and I, obviously, if it's a little bit more spongy, it's going to, it's going to absorb some of the energy from the ball. And I, I think that's going to give you some friction too. And I, I think it just has something to do with the hardness of the lane too. Throughout the course of your career, did you prefer a specific surface over another? <clears throat> I mean, obviously we know you loved Edmund. You won there twice. <laughs> that was wood. <laughs> oh, well, don't we all love that? <laughs> yeah. I seem to always bowl well in the AMF centers. It seems like the pin decks and the, and, and the, and the side, the kickbacks always seem to carry. I, I could trip a lot of fours there. Um, but I mean, over the years, I and mean, we've bowled so many different things. I mean, the, the hardest thing was when we did bowl 
in an arena type setting, the the install that was there was so true that it it did seem like the balls for me. I didn't see the ball as well in that big arena. I, I don't know if it's because of the high ceiling, but it always felt to me like I really wasn't like grabbing it enough, and I always caught myself trying to hit it harder than I than I thought I needed to because I, I just think it might have been the visual perception of it and. But I mean, some of the installs were great. I mean, I, I think all the installs were great. It just seemed like some of the scoring paces were higher than others. Erie was always huge. Um, some others were were tough, but you could get to the pocket. Sure, that's it's so funny that you say that because obviously I was in uh, Vegas for about twelve years, and I pulled league at South Point in the regular center mm -hmm. when they initially built the Plaza, which is I it's beautiful. Right, you get that same exact thing that you just said because they were so true. Right. It goes from like being able to like really yak all over in the front <laughs> of the lanes or do whatever you want. And going up there, it's like, whoa, it's not necessarily not going to hook, but it's like it's ice skating. It's a hockey puck off my hand. It's just yep. so clean and so smooth. You're like, I'm assuming you're talking something like that mm -hmm. on, the, on the arena settings. For sure. And did you make any shows where you bowled on a different surface at the center as opposed to what they installed in the arena? Or was it always the same surface? <sighs> I'm trying to think what Erie, if we bowled on the Brunswick install for the Erie show, because the Erie had the HPLs, I believe. Erie um, definitely had the HPLs. Well, you know what? I think they were AMF on the show there. They, they were AMF on the show. They were. Um, I only remember that because of Learn and uh, Learn the one year Branham on the other show and, uh, and obviously Wiseman. Right. Um, the Masters might have been at Miller Park. That might have been a different one because there was a there were older HPLs at uh, Bolero. And I oh, and you bowled on Bolero. I think we had the different ones at at at, uh, at Miller Park. Um, Interesting. Which did they a, play amazing. similar? So that's so that's a great that's a great one right there because well, I, know I, I think there's a pretty good chance they might not have put the same pattern out for the show as they did for the for the masters okay. i'm not 100 percent sure there has been there was some rumor or some talk that yeah, obviously when we were there um they had some other matches that were going on at, at miller park uh they had like a like a legends match like like some matchups there and the pattern was a little bit different than what we use in the masters and when we built the practice session for the masters the gutter hooked so much more than it did at, at bolero that we weren't sure if that was the same thing or if they had accidentally put the pattern out that they did for the uh, for that other exhibition match and they just decided to stay with it or it could have just been the way the install was but the, they were pretty wide open at in the year that i finished second <coughs> we've talked to uh sorry sorry johnny no, we've uh, we've talked to a lot of the newer guys about how it is on tour now um and there's a lot of camaraderie on the tour a lot of guys are friends um <laughs> You know, they're, they're kind of rooting for each other back in your day. I hate to make you sound, I hate to date yourself and make you sound old, but back when you were on the tour, was it the same way or were you guys more competitive? What was the vibe when you guys were on tour? I think it was both. I mean, you always have rivalries where there's some guys that just don't mesh. Um, I was fortunate enough the last few years that I bowled out there that we were part of the, the motorhome group. The, the trailer trash, so to speak, is what they call ourselves. <laughs> but we had probably 14 people out there in, in fifth wheels and motorhomes that we had our whole little community that, and everybody had their kids out there. And it was actually a lot of fun. I mean, we, and we would bowl each other. We're, we're in competition against each other to try to make a living. But at the same time, we we're all friends off the lane. So I, I think they did a really good job of turning it on and off. We all understood that we're out there for a reason. But we're also coexisting and we all have connections you know with friendships yeah i mean you're all putting food on tables too you know i mean that's... we all help each other out when we needed it and yeah. it was you know I've, I've been on the side of the road in denver with my fifth wheel and one of them stopped and helped us out and we've done the same for others so it's that's it, pretty cool it's still it's still a family to me that that we had out there and, and i'm not sure if it's the same way with the tour now i'm I'm out of touch with that part of it, but I, I assume that you see these guys week in and week out, especially now that we're bowling more across the country and bowling more tournaments. I think you're going to see that develop more. Can you imagine if they had social media back in the day with, you know, like when, when Pete Weber throwing a you know tantrum or throwing balls out of the paddock at Bradley Bull or whatever? I mean, can you imagine some of the stuff that would, would you know, people with their cell phones recording? I mean, you must have, uh, you, you, you bowled with some pretty unique people. Let's just say that. 
it was it was a great time to be out there and and i'm sure oh, it's not any different now but it's just now you know some of the stories that we've had and some of the things that we've got to do was it was fantastic so and some of that stuff's probably better not to see <laughs> i think johnny can agree with that I'm sure. yeah i'll tell you what i the, the reason i wanted to be on tour when i was 12 13 14 years old is because yeah. every single player out there always looked like they were having the time of their lives. There were always so many people at every single bowling center. Now, granted, yeah. I'm a little skewed because my dad's namesake tournament was at my home center, Carolier, right. the great Carolier Lanes. Yeah. So that was 82 lanes, the most spectators, the celebrity pro am, the junior pro am, the, you know, we that's where me and AJ Kachuk bowled against Jerome Bettis and Leroy Horde. Oh. Like it, it, just all the greatest memories ever Wayne Webb running his karaoke in that huge yeah. afterwards and I would be allowed in and I would drink Shirley Temples or whatever the hell I was drinking but I always had that VIP access badge at in my eyes like the, the greatest generation of, of talent it, everybody was so 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 good mm -hmm. everybody was going through the same resin transition everybody was molding their new games to what was being offered and you know every everybody just had passion everybody gave a shit in the locker for better or locker room for better or worse which by the way the smell of the paddock is like almost as sexy to me as hearing irons <laughs> clank, hearing irons clank on the back of the golf cart but, right it's yeah. all those luster kings that you had running yes <laughs> <laughs> luster kings we were talking about that you know a couple of years ago about you know ocho never knew what a luster king was so, oh. uh, you still see him now. I right? thought I was the luster right. king. I thought it was me. You, you, know, you never knew what kind of. Turns out I'm never knew what I'm literally you never knew what your ball's gonna look like when it came out of the luster king. But uh, I, I remember when Litchie was out there, he had three three or four luster kings out there, and we we were bowling at the, the format. Then was you bowl six, B would bowl six, you come back and bowl again. So as soon as you got done with A squad, you'd put your ball in line for however long and. Hopefully there were hopefully it got through the line before your next squad and hopefully it still had compound in it by the time your ball got in there. <laughs> Who are some of your favorite guys to bowl against? Great question. Oh man, like I I always enjoyed bowling the guys that I grew up watching. Um my my one of my first tournaments on tour, I got to cross with Earl Anthony. I made the finals, I got to bowl him in match play, Mark Roth, uh, Marshall Holman. Um Hell yeah, Pete Weber. I got to be really good friends with him over the years, and we always had good matches. They're always fast because as soon as we're up, we take our turn, and then we look around and we're like five frames ahead of everybody. We're like, great, now what? Right. <laughs> but it's it was always fun to bowl those guys because it it made me see where I needed to get better, and if I did well against them, I knew I was improving. And I always looked for the regionals when they had the tour. I, luckily for me, the Midwest region was always strong. Pete, Pete bowled almost every regional. Uh, Ron Williams was on our region then. Rowdy Morrow, Randy Lightfoot, they were born out. All these guys were bowling. Steve Wonderlick. You, you wow. see these guys all the time, and you make a finals, and you had to beat them. You had to get through it. And if you made the smallest mistake, you knew Wonderlick was going to go up and throw three and a tenth to beat you. And you learn how to not do that next time. <laughs> That's and it's funny. weird because my, my first year, like my, um, I started bowling, I don't know, 87 and I, I bowled some regionals before that. I couldn't really make it out of a cut. I, I struggled a little bit. I went on a tour for a full year. I came back and within a few months, I had won my first regional. So it's like the regionals kind of prepared me a little bit for what to see on tour, but the tour taught me what I needed to do when I got back to start winning. And it, it, the two really fed each other well. That's awesome. <clears throat> and the, no, Rob, did you want to say something or can I? Ask? No, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I had this question on the tip of my tongue while you were starting the discussion with the regionals. When you say you learn things from, from watching guys like Pete, can you identify anything during that time between not making a lot and bowling with your idols and then you you have your breakout? What, what are, no matter how small or big, the things that you saw that they executed better than you that you had to work on? I think a lot of it was their ability to repeat shots and, and stay within the game. And Roth, for as, as much of a power game as he had, he was probably one of the best fair shooters on tour. And he always was keeping himself in, in position to, to, to make that big run. 
um, Earl vault crossing with him, just watching him make subtle adjustments, stuff that he did with touch, stuff that he would do with, with speed control and things that you really can't see um, from far away. But when you're watching these guys, you know, grab it a little bit different or try to do some stuff just to try to create a different carry, a, a different shape. Um, again, that was something we had to do because the equipment was a little bit more limited back then, but we didn't know it because that was still the cutting edge technology at the time. Sure. But it was something that I think it's an art form that's gotten lost over the years is the the touch. Um, the reason I'm out here in Detroit right now is because we're um, the, the NAIA college tournament is here and I've been helping coach a college team for the last few years and, and trying to get them to understand the, you know, grabbing it a little bit less or, or touching it a little bit different at the bottom is is kind of foreign to some of them right now. And it's something that, you know, it's just part of the the element that we're in. It's part of the environment. But it watching is, those guys do that was amazing. It, it is a different game now. And, and now you let your equipment, you know, make the adjustments. I mean, not even people moving their feet in the lanes that often. I mean, you just pick up a different ball and, and, and get a different mm -hmm. reaction out of it. But you mentioned Earl, and we always give Johnny crap because Johnny loved Earl, but hated watching him bowl because of his – his boring style and release. But. Well, no, wait, let's. I started that because I, I, we did a good, bad, and ugly, and I didn't understand amateur style here, Steve. You got to remember okay. this. This, is, this <laughs> is the guy who just shows up once a week and throws his three games and goes home. Okay. Or goes to the hey, pub and goes idol. home. There you go. Oh, <laughs> by the way, let me tell you a story about Johnny. So when. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> when he, when he, so I just, I didn't get it. It looked like the guy threw an 80 pound bowling ball because it looked like it had about eight revs to it. Right. For Ocho. <laughs> but my God, the pins were annihilated or he put it on the same dot every time, no matter what the condition was. All right, so listen. he clearly listen. did something right. And it was just a basic and bocce ball style and man the guy knocked down pins. so i did that and then i come to find out jp is like oh exactly exactly 42 titles in a short period of time i mean i'm sure he did something right mm. all right so listen like i'm glad that you said john likes earl i mean here's my completely skewed reason and again it's an opinion, <clears throat> just an opinion my idols growing up on the, on that left side of the lane are the guy who lives up the street, Parker Bone yep. the third. Yep. The guy who's in the living room right now because I'm in Jackson and mom and dad's. That's, that's <laughs> the guy, John Mazza, Ricky yep. Ward, Jason Couch, Steve Cook, Andy Nyer for Christ's sake. Just throw mm -hmm. him in there too. Mm -hmm. Just a of Richie Wolf. These are all the lefties that I think look like beautiful getting to the line right after mentioning all of those guys when i go back and watch guys like earl or i watch guys like mike scroggins or rick lawrence or chris well, you know, there's a big difference we don't don't have have the that's the not right scroggins we can never get him on the show guys do. <laughs> But that's not right. right to say Earl and then Mike Scroggins and then you know like that's a big because the only the guys one if you don't know anything about them is which one hooks it more. <laughs> if you look strictly at the ball roll, right? Wh that's which one I'm knocks the pins about. down more? Like I would rather watch Steve Cook and Jason Couch yell at each other and be beautiful. <laughs> totally get it. Watch Parker stick it. I like to watch Ricky Ward throw a messer. Mike yep. Albee. Mike okay. Olby was the one that figured out a way to be as pretty as the other lefties, but do it even more gently, but just aggressively enough that it still looked awesome. And it was so good to see him bowling this weekend on the show. That was cool. Yeah, to see. Speaking of that, what wow. how awesome. Yeah. And I talked to him at USBC's last year, Steve. He says he bowls three games a year and it's USBC's. That's I it. think he's secretly practicing at his house when the lights are off. <laughs> I think he looks pretty good. He's one of the best ever, as if we didn't know yeah. that. And you mentioned Richie Wolf. I mean, he's another one that I thought should have won a lot. And he had such a good, solid game. And he it just was... never got the potential that I thought he could so have. Just so I'm clear, we're still knocking uh, Earl Anthony, right? Yes. Is that what we're doing right now? <laughs> as gently I just want to make sure. Possible. I just want to make sure for sure. the absolute five greatest that's ever lived, if not the greatest. <laughs> we're, still, we're still beating the shit out of him, right? I, have, I don't have 42 PBA. I don't have 43 PBA caches. I don't think I have four PBA caches. So I'm not crapping on Earl the Pearl. I'm just <laughs> crapping that he's ugly to watch. I'd rather 
I'd and rather no, watch- honestly, Steve, this really came out on a goof of we did a good, bad, and ugly. And I said, I don't understand that whole Earl Anthony swing and his elbows bent like he's he's about to haul a chicken over a barbecue or something. And Johnny went, oh, my God, that's what I think, too. And then, sure yeah. enough, the floodgates opened. And Here we go. <laughs> it wasn't Ocho's intention, but I – Meanwhile, he was my right. hero the growing up. line is somebody – like, this is horrible, but somebody's leading their walker – to go to the restroom and like one of the tennis balls kicks off so they fall forward into the sink. That's what I think is going to happen as he's approaching the line every time. <laughs> I like what Chuck just said about the smiley face ball. Congrats to Walter. I saw Ray. that. That's hey, Walter Ray. Ray. Trey bomb with a smiley face. Two-handed yeah. plastic ball. What can't he do? Hey, real quick, is it possible that uh, Earl Anthony was uh, not – uh, governed and threw an 80 pound bowling ball. Is that possible? Is that, is, is there something that we could do conspiracy wise? Given, given what everyone's already saying now, I, I don't know. I mean, they, they didn't check for lead in the balls back then. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like it's, what if it was 28 pounds, but he, I mean, you can't clearly it's going to go through those pins. Just saying, mark I, it, mark it down. When we get uh, Jesse, the body Ventura to do the conspiracy theory, did Earl Anthony throw 16 pound or 15 pound bowling ball? He didn't have I guns know. like you, Oach, so I don't think he was. Well, right? uh, look, I'm a Second Amendment advocate. I can't help it. It's my fault. He was in his 30s and 40s when he won his titles. I mean, God, man, he couldn't throw that hard. Not to mention, yeah. he was also a professional baseball player. Yeah. Pitcher, as a matter That's of right. fact. Right. I forgot about that. Yeah. I mean, there's. Earl Anthony was? Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. Yeah. So he figured out how to throw overhand and underhand. Like, yeah. that's. I mean, that's he really is one of the absolute greatest talents ever. And if not the greatest of all time in the sport, certainly the greatest of his generation. I mean, I struck out 10 batters, uh, no, well, 11 let's, batters, I think when I 10 year old all star. So let's, not get and let's get back to the, the star of the show. Enough, just, the, the I'm group. just yeah. saying, <laughs> that was all good. greatest athletes, <laughs> July 4th, 1984. Right, I, we love you 11 batters. I just don't like watching you bowl. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Mike Scroggins. All right, we're done bashing Earl Anthony. <laughs> next segment, Rob. <laughs> All right, who's next? We got Great Rob. Great job, guys. <laughs> Great job, guys. Can, can we intro with a sponsor at least, at least for the next segment? What year did you stop the national tour? It was uh, 2011, I believe. That was the last World Series that I bowled. And, and part of that was I had just started a job with the distributor. I worked for Classic Products. And, gotcha. Um, the 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 um, the exempt tour was kind of not really winding down, but the uh, it was getting harder to to justify staying out there for myself. I mean, I was getting up there a little bit in age, and an opportunity came about for me to transition into the business side of it, uh, doing sales for for Classic. And uh, they were nice enough to let me finish uh, my exemption off for that year, so I, I bowled all the tournaments I was exempt for. But at that point, it was it was getting to the point where it was getting it was harder to keep up. Uh, and we were starting to see that transition. Belmo was was out there, and we were starting to see more more of that type of lane play come in, which I, I just worked all those years to get rid of that. And it was I didn't want to go back. <laughs> what did you think when you first saw a guy like Belmo with all his his uh, success? It you know at first I mean his, his he's actually progressed quite a bit because I mean earlier when he. Um, didn't he win the plastic ball tournament in, in Long Island? That was, was oh, wait. did he win that one? I know he made the show yeah. there. Yeah, so he, he, um, he had, uh, I, I think he's evolved quite a bit. I mean, he's definitely gotten a lot smoother. And, and, and I, I like watching him get to the line because his ball roll to me looks more normal. I mean, his, his tilt and his rotation, it's readable. Simonson has the same thing. Some of the tilt you see on somebody's two handers, it's it's like tipped down a little bit to where it's almost spinning down toward the lane. Which, to me, it's hard to see that. It's hard to read the lane. And I, it's and a I, little flying saucery almost. A Maybe little bit, like uh, like, like guys like a Zach Wilkins or maybe even like a Packy Hanrahan, like Matt or or even. Um, uh, the guy that just won a couple weeks ago, he had a, a, a little bit more of a, of a negative tilt. Um, Boog, Boog, whatever. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, our oh, last his, guess. His, his is going down a little yeah. bit more. And I, and I see I, I see Belmo going a little bit more traditional. Simonson going that way. I can relate to that more because I like watching that ball reaction. And I think I can read that a little bit better. Sure. But watching, again, helping the college kids out, you see a ton of two-handers now. Junior bowls, you see a ton of them. Some of them are not as good yet. 
and some of them really have potential, but watching a lot of them think that they really need that left hand to, 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 to create the revs and talking to Belmo and, and, and Simo, their, their left hand really does nothing to it except guide the ball. So I've got a couple pictures of both of them at the point of release in my phone that you can, they look exactly like everybody else at the point of release. And that's what I try to show these kids when they're, when they're learning. It's like, we got to get your hand in that position, but we don't want to tip that over too much. Um, try to get something a little bit more readable. But again, I mean, the success is still there. These guys are still bowling great with, with, that type of role and it's not that it's a good or a bad thing but it's just I, I like watching more of the the shape that i can relate to i agree with you there too <clears throat> well the left hand would just create more of a spinning effect rather than a roll right like that I, I think that's what tips it down if, if right, they hit it right, with the right. left that, that tips the whole axis down to where the, the if you put a piece of tape on it it would be facing the lane and more. that's how i get I, I get amateur status i i think like flying saucer like you almost mm -hmm. see like a like a third like close encounters of a third kind kind of like spin mm -hmm. or maybe more like a full roller type without the thumb in it you know right, right. yeah yeah I, I see. I, I see what you're saying, Oach, and that obviously, definitely, what you're saying there, Steve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, it, it's a traditional readable role, and on, does it does it hold true? Because Simo and Belmo, but well, has to because they're knocking the pins down. And even guys like Troop, even though Tro Troop is like a little bit more gentle, yeah. he's got a, a more he's got that role too. Also, so mm -hmm. it's amazing that even with the two hands, for everybody listening, it's a two hander because half the population is now. The traditional ways are still reigning supreme. It's, it's, no, that's exactly what it is. They're, they're, look at their head. They're under the ball. They're completely mm -hmm. under the ball. And it, depending on the condition, of course, like Troop, like the last couple of tournaments, he, he he almost took his hand out of it mm -hmm. and just kind of popped it out, but kept under it and let the, you know, kind of let the ball do the work, really. Let it, let it roll how it's supposed to, which is, I guess, what you guys are talking about, reading the lane and – for sure. Getting forward and getting face in the pocket. That this is where yeah. I don't know what I'm saying. That's Way more predictable so. front to back. Right. And so, I think Simonson and even Belmo are, are so good at, at backing their hand out of it. I mean, Simo can change his rev rate a little bit to where you can really see him float it, even though he's hitting it with two hands. You can see some shots he's can he can put more on it than others, and he's he's really good at the touch part of it. Absolutely. Clear, clearly, yeah, the game throw it straight almost. It seems right. like the, the one tournament a couple weeks ago. Steve, that's a great that's a great question for you. So, mm -hmm. every bowler has an A game, a B game, a C game. But you guys, being the best of the best, you're you're great at all of them. But where, ideally, like your first shot of practice at a PBA event, mm -hmm. where do your feet want to go first? Where is your actual comfort zone, or do you even have one? I think. When we know what the pattern is ahead of time, I have an idea of where I want to see the ball shape at, and I'll, I'll try to go there first. So on a shorter pattern, I'm going to try to be a little bit closer to the gutter because I think that's where the break point is going to be. The longer patterns, I'll be a little bit deeper just to see what I got. Um, but, I mean, my comfort zone is still kind of like, you know, standing 15, 16, trying to go like 8 to 5 and just trying to see what I got, see where that – I I personally try to stay as far right as I can at the beginning – because then I feel like I always have room to move uh, accordingly. I feel like if I start too deep too soon, it, it kind of cuts some of the lane out for me, and it doesn't give me much, uh, much move, much places to move to. But sometimes that will hurt me because I'll be out there a little bit farther from where everybody else is, and then my next move is way bigger, and I'll get trapped sometimes. And so, is it harder to move right than it is to move left sometimes for you? You want to start start right work your way in and then and then figure out your track line i guess that's kind of what i what my thought process is and, and there's a lot of times that i'll actually be going back right as the tournament goes on and just try as to you keep, get the hang spot shape. or something exactly and, yeah, yeah. My, my instinct is to do that but it's not always the right move especially what, with today's game what led you to become a coach well i um i have i have two kids that we, I tried to help them bowl as they were getting older. And as they got into high school, we didn't have a uh, high school program where we went. And one of the uh, one of the other coaches had gotten the program together. So I, I decided to help them. That with As long as my kids were there, I was helping the program. And even after they graduated, I still helped. And as they moved into uh, the collegiate part of it, I didn't really do much with them while they were in school, so much, per se. Uh, but my daughter was going to St. Ambrose in Iowa and there were some opportunities that came up with the JV team where they needed a coach and they asked me to fill in. 
and I kind of got hooked on it from that point because I was able to kind of help the teams a little bit. I was able to kind of lend some knowledge to it and maybe help them see the lane better. I always thought I was, I had a pretty good eye for reading ball reaction and trying to help them line up. So that kind of progressed to, as they moved to a different school, I kind of helped that program <laughs> and I kind of follow them around, but I've been with, uh, with St. Francis and Joliet uh, for a few years now. And that that's where they finished their schools at. And um, I've been with them for a few years after that because um, the, the, I, I feel like a, it's close enough to home. I can help the program, and I, I really like helping the teams try to get better. The reason I ask is we had Bakes on the show mm -hmm. a few weeks ago, and uh, you know, not many people can make that transition from being a pro to being a coach. Some guys just aren't cut out for it. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it takes – obviously, everybody has the passion for the game, but not <coughs> everybody has the ability to, to, to be a good coach. So I just want to – just kind of wonder what was your mindset when you were when you were first asked obviously you coach your kids but i mean when you were first asked to coach after after you were coaching them um were you like sure let's let's do it I, you know you enjoyed it at that point absolutely and I, and it's like i'm not even in the same category as somebody like baker <laughs> for sure but the, the little bit that i can bring as far as you know ba you know i don't want to say basic but more Lane play, uh, surface management, how to, how to see the lane a little bit better. And we do a lot of, a lot with physical stuff and spare shooting. I mean, that's the, the biggest thing, especially, I mean, honestly, it doesn't matter what the scoring pace is. If it's a low scoring pace, you're going to have to make your spares. But if it's a high scoring pace, it's just as important because somebody that goes six bagger, nine out sheet is not going to win to somebody that, that didn't, that made their spares. So. Right. It's even more important, and it's it's frustrating when when they're not doing well at it. But we're working on it. Was it difficult for you to try to teach the two handers since it was something that you weren't really familiar with? Fortunately for me, I work more with the ladies' team, so we don't have as many of them yet. Okay. But we are we are seeing more and more of them show up. And with me having the reference of like Belmo and Simonson and some of the guys there, I I can. I can definitely help them. Even the guys that we, we've got a lot of two handers on our team too. And we just try to help them see the lane better and, and just try to try to some different stuff with, with touch, you know, just, just try to do something where it's not just grab it harder and move in. It's right. not always the answer. That's true. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> How much bowling do you do now? Uh, not a ton, but it's. I'm, I'm trying to get a little bit more. Um, I still bowl two or three leagues a week, and I'll bowl some tournaments on the weekends. I'm trying to bowl some more regionals. Uh, the PBA 50 stuff, I never really bowled as much of it just because with, with the job at Classic, um, our season, even though the bowling season ends in April, and that's pretty much when the PBA 50 stuff starts, we're in prep work for all of our trade shows and all of our bowl expo stuff and, and a lot of stuff that happens. So I don't have mm -hmm. as many opportunities. I can still get away and bowl some, but it's like I, I would like to get out there for a few weeks and actually try it. I've been trying to get in a little better shape. I've been bowling some more stuff now. So I had actually already committed to bowl the tournament of champions before they, they notified me that I was getting in the hall of fame, which was kind of cool. So I was going to be there anyway. And uh, I'm like, all right, I'll stay two more days, but <laughs> oh darn i know all right Talk me, but, twist uh, my arm all right. yeah so i bowled it last year and i didn't do very well but um but it was pretty cool having our front row seats is what some of these guys can do and and bring some of that back to, to some of the teams that we we help coach and it, it's pretty cool my last question was uh it's a good segue uh did you expect tom clark to come up and, and tell you that did you have any kind of were there any rumors out there that, you know, you might be part of a vote or anything like that, or it just took you by surprise? It, completely by surprise. Um, cool. I know this year was the new, this was the first year that they added this veterans category to it, which was four players that didn't quite meet the criteria of the 10 game or 10 titles, or I think it's five with two majors. I had seven that's, with one major and I was just for me. But yeah. you, you also had players like, you know, Robert Smith and, and, Ryan Schaefer, you know, Guppy Troop, even and, uh, Rob yeah. Learn, yeah. Um, guys like that that definitely had Hall of Fame careers and they deserve to be there. And it, it, I mean, I mean, Johnny, you know as well as anything. Only one shot, one way or the other, can make the difference in winning or losing. And there's so many guys that get there so often. It's just it's hard to it's hard to win. Steve, if you go back a, a couple episodes, uh -huh. um, I get pretty aggressive with this topic. Yeah, mm -hmm. I have to watch that one. <laughs> I mean, actually, uh. It actually all spawned from, and I actually remember Stacy Learn 
was in was in the chat that night and and a couple can't, i can't remember who else was there but we were and tom hess was in the chat tonight and we were talking about awesome. tom hess's hall of fame induction mm -hmm. and that's what spawned the entire conversation and then led us into the discussion of the vet category we started analyzing the the tenure you know what happens if some of these guys with eight titles and a million dollars in a major had had family obligations what if they tore their meniscus and or what if they're robert smith and battled injuries left and right oh, and, it's, and then to to go and take somebody or already ha have somebody like say roy buckley in the pba hall of fame or, or take somebody like tom hess who in my eyes is a hall of famer but is like nowhere near what you guys and the other guys on the ballot have accomplished on the regular pba tour i went off on an entire tangent we all did mm -hmm. but we were, were it was we, we couldn't be happier that they introduced the category, but in like in our eyes, it's not the veterans category. It's simply you're a PBA hall of famer for performance. That's it. And it's you still all is performance. It, it, oh, yeah. it, I mean, and it, it's that performance and, and the longevity of being out there for all those years is what gets you considered for it. And yeah, right. the fact that, that, so, so when they announced, they, they announced Tom Hess this year, and then uh, I saw John Weber is getting in, um, which is awesome yeah, and, as absolutely. well. And then uh, Chrisman's are also getting in. So I, at that point, I'm like, you know what? If, if the veterans category happens, it's probably not going to be this year. Because I, I don't really remember all the years that we've done it that they did more than three. So I was completely surprised. And, you know, he, ironically, he did it at a college tournament we were coaching. And Jason Thomas comes down and asks me, you know, yeah, we want to interview you and your team in between, you know, the lunch break. I'm like, that's fine. I'll make our, our, our head coach is over there. I just, I'm the assistant. He's like, no, we want to talk to you. <laughs> I'm like, oh, great. I'm like, now he did that in front of our coach. Now he's going to think I'm trying to steal his thunder. <laughs> so he's like, ah, we just want to do something. You with did. The I did. Well, a little bit, but. Unintentionally, uh, <laughs> but you did. <laughs> I know. Um, so I, um, he just said, he, you know, we want to do kind of the, the, the PBA angle that you bowled on tour and you're helping the team. So we did, we started off some fun questions and I completely never saw him coming up. I mean, he did a pretty good job of distracting me with the questions, which he did his job. Yeah. And, but it didn't, it, it, I didn't really see Tom that day, but if it, if I did, it wouldn't have surprised me because his son bowls for college and he would have been there anyway. So I didn't really even put two and two together. And, and the, the fact that against the names like, like, like Schaefer and Smith and learn that they, they voted me in was just, you know, amazing i mean i i never would have saw that coming goosebumps i was, I was just saying freaking goosebumps <laughs> right there holy shit. I, mean, I mean they're all great too but i mean don't ever sure. just, I mean, don't ever discount what you did in your career because i mean you, you well, we're all our own worst critic no, too I, but I, that's I, but i i get it i get man and the best part is i don't think they'll lose the footage on this one no Hopefully. they won't <laughs> it's, it's definitely out there forever i saw it, it on, Facebook. on x I saw it on Facebook and I was I was super happy to hear the news. And <laughs> when, when he was telling it, did did it register, or were you just kind of trying to? Uh, it, you know, I. When it's it got to be up, like a you're full of shit moment almost. Well, like, who the hell is this guy? Come like, on, is this a rib? <laughs> I I knew that they do that, and and actually it's pretty cool the way they they surprise everybody. And it, 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 I love watching the videos when, when he does that. And when when they had asked me to to do the video. I'd be like, oh, that'd be pretty cool if they were told me it was an Hall of Fame. I'm like, ah, it's not, it, it, it's not going to happen this year. I'm like, yeah, it's just like things that are going through my head. Right. And then when he popped up next to me, I'm, it, it's still kind of like it threw me. I'm like, well, maybe he's going to say something or, you know, maybe he just wanted to interrupt. I don't know. But um, yeah, I, I was completely, uh, completely shocked. So I probably looked more stupid than I felt. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it was cool. <laughs> Nothing like raw, real shit man yeah i, I, no, I love yeah. it i really it was a great moment and i'm glad it took you by surprise i'm glad you didn't know ahead of time because you had your natural reaction but i mean it's yeah. it, it's a cool thing and you know with the advent of social media you're always going to have your idiots out there and your detractors and we we deal with them every single week we have a segment called the imbecile of the week that's how bad some of these people are but uh <laughs> you know a lot of guys are like what how, how, why is he getting in and and not doing the research we had jeff riggles light a couple people up in uh in uh, a lot of the bowling forums because they're like, why he doesn't have 10 titles. He doesn't, you know, he only has one major. And Jeff's like, well, if you read the article, you would have realized that it's a veterans category. Uh, and so there's different criteria, but a lot of people mm -hmm. also want to put an asterisk next to it. And, and that kind of led me to think like, <laughs> number one, these guys have That's never done it. Steve's juicing. 
Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Steve's yeah. Like, he was on the juice. Right. Um, <laughs> well, we know Earl's balls were, were had lead in them. They're so. heavy. So yeah. we, we established that. <laughs> um, but I mean, the hall is the hall. And it, it just kind of leads into what Johnny said. Like, it still means the same to you. It doesn't matter what category it is. They're still recognizing you for your performances and for your career and the success you had, because it's not easy, especially back in your day with all those bowlers and all the games you had to bowl to make TV shows. And even though you didn't win them all, you still made quite a few appearances on TV as well, which is yeah. hard to do. Yeah, I, um, think I went 20 yeah. straight seasons with at least one telecast. Exactly. Yeah. So to and me, at least a half a dozen tournament leads at least. Right, Steve? Yeah. yeah, there were several. I mean, it, like the one in Erie when Wiseman beat me was a lead. I, I, I think I led in uh, at, at your dad's tournament in Jersey. I'd won, I'd led there. I'd made the show there a couple times. You made TV there a couple times. Huh? Yeah, and I can think of plenty of them that you know. It, it, it happens. I mean, Peoria and Sebring. Yeah. There's, but there's others that I, I ran the ladder, and it. Yeah, I was fortunate that the very first show that I made, I was a tournament leader, and I, I was able to come away with the win, but. It doesn't happen very often, then. No. Do you try to put that? Do you pay attention to that noise, or do you just try to put it behind you? I mean, obviously, you're going to enjoy it. You're going to be inducted. You're going to get to make a speech. You're going to be enshrined in Akron. But I mean, do you give any credence to what some of the idiots say on on social media? Not really. I mean, it, it, I mean, it's so easy to sit back and and like like what Riggle said, if they don't look at all the at all the stats and and it, it's it's obviously a career. It's not just a few years. Um, True. I, I, think at this point i'm still in the top 15 in the money list for career so that means there's only 14 people in the history of the tour that ever made more money that's right um it took a while but i mean it, it that just shows the longevity of being out there and, and i think schaefer put it best that you know that it meant that you had to consistently perform year after year to be able to make that that to, to make that consistent earnings and to be able to to stay out there and it it's a grind i mean it, we had long formats you know, my, my very first year on tour i think i bowled 36 weeks yeah. Wow. I didn't bowl well the first year. But... The lifestyle too. I mean, I'm I'm assuming your fan your family wasn't always with you all the time. I mean, I know there were months and months that it was me, mom, and Jamie. Right. You know, I mean, but to be able to maintain that lifestyle, you know, in a hotel room every night, even before before cell phones for Christ's sake, you know, making <laughs> plan times to call from the room or let you know where you are on your driving journey. And like yeah. It's, it's, I remember sitting in the lobby of the hotel room, standing in line with all the guys waiting for the for the pay phones. Because <laughs> we were all there, you know. It's, it's the the it's so it's so much more than just what we see on the lanes, and to be able to do that for twenty years, thirty years, forty years. I mean, it's it's a true testament to how, like how it's 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 understanding why you guys are the best in the world, and I think that's like kind of. The culmination of what the hall actually means is you're surrounded by fellow people that understand the journey and what it takes and decided to do it anyway and then right. did it as one of the best ever so yeah for that, it's, a, it's a commitment i mean it was you it was a lifelong deal hell yeah uh well but see, i wouldn't we, trade it <laughs> no i well obviously not, obviously not um thank you for being here we we absolutely had a pleasure talking to you uh i love talking to guys I grew up watching on TV. Um, and uh, it, was, it was just a real treat. Um, anything you want to plug? Anything you want to let people know what's going on with you? I'm just uh, just bowling as many terms as I can. Like I said, I, I, I started working for Classic Products. I've been bowling on, on the regional stuff. I still follow Phil around, so I'm with Radical and still back with the Brunswick guys. So it's uh, that, that's probably been most of my career. Like I said, um, your dad gave me the first uh, contract I had with Brunswick. I was there for a long time. And then stuff got shook up a little bit, but we ended up back there. So it's been it's been a lot of fun. So now just uh, coaching the collegiate stuff now. I've got some regionals this weekend and uh, got got other stuff to bowl. So and we just scratched the surface here. We got to uh, we got to dive deep next. We got to have him on next time and uh, at some dive. point and talk Anytime. about the tournaments and <laughs> talk about the anxiety and the stress. Oh, yeah. and like that, that <laughs> this is. This is this is not a one parter for this guy. There's no. Way. Oh no! Anytime you guys want. It's, it's always. I gotta a get. I gotta get a new laptop though, because my hair is a lot lighter on this one than it was on the video you showed me. So I think I need a new camera. It's definitely the camera for sure. <laughs> yeah. My hair the looks the same no matter what <laughs> yeah, I do. I don't know what's good. going on. I'm good. <laughs> 
Well, Steve, thank you very much for being here, brother. Good luck with the team this weekend, and uh, we'll definitely have you on again in the future. Thank yeah, you anytime. for giving us your time. I had a great time, guys. Thanks. Good to see you. All right, all. Steve. Awesome, thank you. Steve. Yep. Have a good night. Thanks, sir. Right. Thank you. I'll say why Dad was why Dad signed Steve because he watched Steve bowl. He watched he knew Steve, talent. I said talent knows always, talent, man. Yeah, the, one that. thing that always defined Brunswick, especially in that era, was we had the classiest staffers. And Steve is nothing but class on and off the lanes. And I'm I'm telling you right now, without even asking Dad, that's why he signed Steve. Could Aside be that's gotta be mustache, I'm the glasses and the hair. It's it was it was definitely his the way Dude, he it looked like it was cold. Lives. It was so it was Inspector Willoughby like somebody go fact check Inspector Willoughby, put it on the straight up five Facebook page. You'll see what I'm talking about. It was perfect. Yeah. Totally. Sorry, I'm just gonna Google Inspector Willoughby right now. Go ahead. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, he lost me too, so maybe we can put him up. Are you kidding me? Are you guys really like, not so many years old. Knows Inspector like, Willoughby? Who's chat? Oh, shit. Maybe you're right. Hold on. Let me get a picture. See? Go ahead. You just don't know my name. Is it a person? A, a place? Inspector Willoughby. He was a cartoon guy. He's like a Woody Woodpecker guy. He was a Yogi Bear oh, guy. So like was... Inspector Gadget? Come on. Rob, don't you have a picture? Uh, I'm working on it. Want to see pictures? I'll show you pictures. Oh, okay. some pictures. Oh, nope. 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 Everybody knows Ocho uh, knows pictures. All right. Well, anyway. Uh, uh, yeah, just just before, before you I'm end the show... Just come on, Rob. I, I'm geez. pulling it. Look, things don't work. This yeah, I know time. you're pulling it all the time. There we go. Now get the frontal. Zero. That's now. I'm telling you, he combed it just like him. It Zero. Was, and when he would talk, just the mustache would just do like this. He kind of looks like Robert Mustair, Mister Nine Hundred. He does kind of look like. <laughs> oh, we can't ah, forget that. Right. So, in case you guys want to go check it out, it's still going on. The good old Union County, Illinois Fair. Nothing compares to the unmanscaped hay. As well. That's true. That's very true. <laughs> Uncircumcised, unmanscaped. Every girl's dream. Honor. Speaking of which, Johnny, we got to pick a we got to pick a winner for next. We're gonna announce a winner next week for who wins oh, yes. one of Johnny's balls. Mm -hmm. That's right. So you guys still have a chance if you I'm want. I'm sorry that happened to you that you lost. I can't believe we made it through an entire show without me talking about nationals, which is amazing. Oh, so, okay. you had such a good. Well, next week. Yeah, we'll do it next week. This is wonderful. Uh, on behalf of uh, Lucas and I, thanks again for all of our viewers for being here, and Derica, thank you again for for the chicken. It is a cool chicken. Um, but, uh, yeah, hopefully we don't hear that noise ever again. Don't worry, I'm going to open next show. With a I knew, I, I, I knew. That's the new intro of the chicken. Uh, by the way, uh, just a quick spoiler. Hey, Troy, alert. thank you for being here again, Troy, as always. Uh, just to want to announce a future guest we're going to have uh, after the tour wraps up. Kevin McCune has agreed to be on our show. But <laughs> if anybody's seen Porky's, that's kind of like that. When Porky Did you say was Kevin McCune? Yes, Kevin McCune will be on our show. He's, he's a little busy, obviously, with the tour, but uh, he said probably maybe hey, wait, after the world. Did Steve beat his dad in one of the shows? After the TOC, he said. He said uh, oh, not McCune. I'm sorry. I'm the new I'd like to talk new. to Kevin about baseball, even more so than bowling. So that would be awesome. I'm sure he'll talk about whatever you want. But uh, after the TOC, he will, will we'll find time to get him on, but he definitely wants to come on the show. So, uh, But, yeah, next week I, I would love to talk about Vegas uh, and Stephanie. Stephanie uh, Sheridan. Uh, has been the subject of some attention as of late as well. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, maybe, yeah, maybe it's we can have her on. It's been a while since we've had her on. I would definitely like to, you know, between, um, again, I'm a Jersey boy now. I uh, I bowl league with Carson Lacocious, who just won her second PWBA title or regional title. And on that same show in Delaware was my doubles partner, Stephanie. It would be, and Stephanie also, and I know she wasn't happy with her performance, but she threw it wonderfully at USBCs. So you can yeah. obviously tell why she murdered them at the, at the regional leading up to it. Yeah. But um, I would like to kind of talk to both of them because after speaking with Carson about it, she had both uh, Mike and Kara, her parents there to see this win, whereas she only had one parent at the previous one. So she said that was like, she was a little bit choking up by that, which was awesome. And, but 
and she's been bowling great for for so long. But Steph, I want to get her perspective because Steph was finding her game, and then she got it at the right time. Yeah. So it's kind of like it's two different reasons for the success. And I like to hear it from two hungry bowlers, and what better two to start it with? Yeah, that's a fantastic idea. I will uh, lean on you to make that happen. Well, you can do that when you're not strong. Uh, it sounds like due He'll to your strength, yeah. I'll be his friend. He'll help you carry on. Yeah. Speaking of which, I do have to. Uh, I do you have to. That is Bill Withers, right? Uh, what? what? I'm sorry. What was that? Just calling me, brother. That's Bill Withers. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. He's yeah. leaning on me, Oach. When you need a friend, I mean, maybe. Yeah, I said, is that Bill Withers? And you're like, it what? might be. I don't fucking know, man. What I don't know nice everything. I know 99 percent of things. I don't know that. You guys. know every Steelers. You knew the song. You didn't know the artist of the song we were singing just now. Not on that one, no. Fuck that. Because that's it's all stupid. you had to say. I because finally got If the movie didn't come out, I the song would have like still been buried. All right, that's enough. We're getting stupid. All right, yeah, no, we're out of here. Uh, guys, thanks for showing up tonight. Thank you for joining us on our YouTube channel as well as our Pay hey, attention Twitter. to Apple iTunes and leave us a five-star review. That's a great point. Oh, that's a great yeah, point. Yeah, something you never say. It's true. No, it's true. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, we'll be back next week. Appreciate you guys. And uh, fuck you, Doc Sullivan. So, yeah, good night, everybody.